When I was asked to come on and speak about the, the, the Kennedy legacy or what the Kennedy legacy might mean to Ireland or on a personal level, what it means to me or what it might mean to Wexford at the moment, I was tempted to go away and do a lot of research and then I kind of thought, well, why not just actually think about it a little bit and think about how does, how does either the image of John F. Kennedy, the ideal of John F. Kennedy or what he was or what he might have been, how did that resonate for me in my own childhood and growing up in my life now? And I can remember growing up in Adamstown, not a terrible distance away from here, there were, there were kind of two almost cultural or almost holy objects uh, uh, in our house. And one of them was a, a, um, a coffee table book that was a, um, a record of JFK's visit uh, here to Ireland. And the other was de Valera's response to Churchill. Uh, um, and the two were strangely linked, I think, in, in our minds growing up, at least they were in how they were presented to us. And I used to listen to one and, and, and read the other quite a lot. And de Valera's response seemed to speak about a resistance to being something that we didn't want to be and what we might yet become. And it seemed to me that, that particularly with the, within our family anyway, and I, know, I know my dad certainly felt like this, that John F. Kennedy symbolized a notion of modernity that, that he wanted to see Ireland embrace, or perhaps that we wanted to embrace. And somehow isn't it extraordinary that he still represents modernity in some form? I mean, a figure from the 1960s represents modernity. Uh, you might recall in the 2007 general election there was a series of posters featuring Enda Kenny that were very Kennedy-esque, or Enda Kenny that were very Kennedy-esque. People spoke about it at the time. Isn't that an interesting uh, thing to ponder? That, that somebody who wanted to present themselves as a leader for Ireland in 2007 wanted to resonate with the leader that had come from, from uh, the, the early 1960s. And, and why was that the case? I, I think that's interesting. And if we, if we think then about what Kennedy represented, and I did scan a couple of them, remembered a couple of the major speeches uh, that were made over the years, John F. Kennedy spoke an awful lot about the notion of social solidarity, and not just at the level of a nation, but at the level of, of people globally, the, the notion of global uh, social solidarity on a, on, a, on a human level. He certainly spoke about it in the context of the United States. He spoke an awful lot about human rights. He spoke an awful lot about the relationship between a state and its people, uh, and the role that the state should play uh, in the lives of its people. And that's a conversation that I'm not sure we've ever actually had in Ireland. And that got me thinking about, well, what should the legacy be? Because I think here, we're very good at looking at things, perhaps through green or rose-tinted glasses, that remembers what they might represent, rather than thinking about what they should and do represent for us, and how we can, how we can learn or explore more about who we are through them. Um, we do not have, for instance, in this country, I don't think, a really well-developed social contract. We have never collectively as a people decided who we are, how we're going to structure ourselves, what is the role of the state versus the people or its citizens, uh, and we've never debated or discussed that. If you contrast that, for instance, with the United States now, where the constant, at times, uh, um, rather two-dimensional political debate is about big government, small government, the role of the state, the role of the people, individual freedoms, what's the responsibility of the state to its people, etc. We don't do that here, and we've never really done that here. Um, we emerged post-independence as a fledgling republic with really extraordinary ideas. If you look back at the one that I always think about, if you look back at the program for government for the first all, there's a, and I'll paraphrase, so there are people in this audience who will get it right, so I'll paraphrase it and we'll see how it goes. There's a section in it where, where it says that the first duty of the government of the republic should be to guarantee the, welfare, the, the safety of its children, or the well-being of its children so that no child suffers wrong, and then it talks about moral danger, cold, hunger, deprivation. A fledgling state in 1919, seven decades before the international community developed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, was talking about the primary responsibility of a republic to its most vulnerable citizens and to guarantee certain provisions. Uh, and they were what we now understand as economic, social, cultural rights. Things like enough food to eat, a roof over your head, to be safe and to be protected. What happened between 19 and 19, 1919 and now that we never continued on that conversation or that debate? And if we look to Kennedy, if we look to the words that he spoke, the vision that he had, the leadership that he showed, 
how do we manifest that here now? And how are we living in an Ireland in 2012 where the collective social disdain for politics and for politicians, I think actually, is, is, a, is a real negative for us being able to move forward in a constructive way as a society. Now, I'm not saying in any way that some or much or even elements of that, of that disdain or disregard or disrespect haven't been earned and deserved in some quarters. But what kind of society are we if we don't look to ourselves to begin to express a set of values that are then represented by our leadership with whom we engage, the people that we elect as our leaders, with whom we engage and with whom we converse in a way that informs their decision making. Um, Kennedy, it seemed to me, believed in that idea of a social contract. Uh, we speak the language of it. And as we look back at our political culture, as we, we remember the birth of the nation. I mean, that's the other thing, by the way, that strikes me as a huge difference between the United States and here. When they talk in the United States about the foundation of the nation, they talk about the ideas that underpinned its foundation. They talk about the founding ideas, their principles. There's endless debate about what the founding fathers meant, about what were the founding principles of the state. We actually don't really do that here. We talk about the means through which the state was founded. We talk about revolution, not in terms of revolution of ideas, but the taking up of arms. How did we let that happen? And how are we still letting it happen? We're at a point in 2012 that I think anybody here would agree is probably the gravest, not just economic, but political, social, and cultural crisis that the state has ever faced. We have a government that's grappling to try to come to grips with that crisis, to try to manage a way through an economic crisis at a time when we don't have economic sovereignty, when they can't make the decisions that any sovereign, would, any sovereign government would normally make and to get us back to, sovereign, uh, back to sovereignty. And yet at the same time, there is no real engaged public debate about what got us to that point beyond an understandable desire to point fingers in particular directions, and a justified one in many ways. But there's, nothing has emerged that says, what do we need to change in really profound, straightforward ways about the nature of our culture, both political and social culture, how we engage with the state as citizens of the state, how we inform the decisions that are made by those that we elect into positions of leadership, and what are the values that should inform uh, um, uh, um, those decisions. Who are we? What do we stand for? Are we a republic and what does that look like? Kennedy spoke about those ideas and those themes all of the time. So the legacy that I desperately like to see happen, and I don't mean this in a preachy way, I mean I, I'm very conscious of the fact that, that it's very easy these days to start talking about how things should be. And in talking about it in that way, what I want to really talk about is the role that I think we all have to play individually in creating the kinds of conversations that help us make really difficult decisions about where we might get as a country. And I know we're banjized. I know we're broke. I know that Minister Howland and others are trying to find ways to get through this uh, um, with the minimum possible impact uh, on, on people's lives. And we've seen uh, issues this week arising in particular in relation to that. But shouldn't we at least, outside of politics, begin to talk about where we go afterwards? If we get back into the bond markets next year, if we emerge from, from a bailout and get our sovereignty back, what do we want to do with it? To what end do we want it? How will we correct the mistakes of the past that led us to us losing it in the first place? And what role will each of us play uh, in deciding uh, those kinds of profound changes that need to happen within our society? Kennedy spoke about big ideas. Uh, we are a country that had got to the point where we started to describe anybody who spoke about big, lof big lofty ideas as idealistic or a bit of an idiot. We need to become as boldly, courageously idealistic as Kennedy certainly seemed to be, me, seemed to, be to me when I was growing up. Uh, and we need to start those, to ask those questions of ourselves. So I think it's time that we made that the Kennedy legacy. Uh, or even the legacy of the, of the experience that we've had so far uh, as a relatively young state with a very, very old history uh, and become the kind of nation, the kind of country, the kind of republic that we talk about uh, but do very little to create perhaps sometimes ourselves. And I think that's a job that's down to uh, each and every one of us. I'd love that to be the Kennedy legacy. Thanks very much. Thank you.
on south of Wexford, they still gravitate towards Wexford, and you're still living actually in North County Wexford. But the question I'll put to you, because you're working with Amnesty International, why do you choose still to live in this county, this county of yours? Well, I, I couldn't say something really romantic, or I could be very honest about it, and say that when I moved back here in 2003 and, and, and sold a, a terraced house that I had in London, I started looking at Dublin and couldn't afford to buy anything, so the circus <laughs> company. <laughs> And I never expected I'd end up back living in Wexford, but was delighted that it happened. I mean, when I moved back in 2003, it used to take me two hours and 20 minutes to get into the office in the morning. It now takes me about an hour and 10 minutes to come up. And lots of people think that's an awful commute because I commute up and down to Dublin every day. But I mean, I lived in London for 17 years and you'd commute for an hour and 15 minutes to get into work just on the tube somewhere. So yeah. uh, that's how I ended up. That's there. And delighted. I mean, delighted. I just one final question for the moment again. I'll we'll give you a chance to ask Colin and Professor Kevin and the other two speakers anything you like at the end of this. But just could you localise what you said? What you said spoke about national. If you localise Wexford, how are we from a wheat bearing as a county? In the context well, of what you said. Uh, how have we ever fared uh, as a county? I mean, I, I, I had a little run of things. Uh, lost the run of myself in about 2006, 2007 and, and, and dared to, to consider getting involved in, in, in politics. Um, and I can remember at the time um, trying to find a way to say things that I thought were, were, were difficult enough to say and that was that I believed that the kind of politics that had played out in Wexford over 30 or 40 years hadn't served the county particularly well. I mean, I can remember in 2006, well, I'm going to sound like I'm back in, back in campaign for it again, but I don't mean it like that. But it was almost like we, we where, where, is, where is Wexford now? Wexford is in the same place as everybody else. I can remember at one point in, in 2006 saying that part of the problem that we face is that this constant belief in Ireland that a constituency will only ever do well when we have a minister at the table. And a lot, of the, a lot of that campaign played out around the idea that, well, okay, if Eva Fall will win this election, who will be the minister? And don't we, don't we have to try and get a couple of fellows at the table? And I remember saying at the time that one of the things that I'd love to see happen is that ministers uh, um, uh, should have to appear before the Public Finance Committee on an annual basis, uh, and that the committee should examine spending their department on a constituency basis. And any minister who had favoured their own constituency for a particular reason would have to objectively evidence why that was necessary. Because the job of the minister is not to act in the interest of his constituents. He has to do that, of course, as a TD, but it's to act in the national interest. And people laughed at me because of that idea. Because it's like, don't be ridiculous. That's not going to work. And sure, we'll hang on there. We'll have a minister. We we'll now have two people at cabinet. And that's great. I think that's very positive. But I think it's a shame that that's positive. Because it means that at any particular time, there's 15 constituencies that will do okay, and the rest of us are screwed. <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, that's, I think, where that thing that I'm talking about becomes more important. We have to start to become more than a nation of tribes or streets or localities. I mean, Ireland needs to become not just a republic, but maybe a nation for the first time. <coughs> you know, that actually we get behind the idea that there is such a thing as social solidarity, and I don't just mean in the obvious liberal left-wing kind of way that I'm often accused of, of talking from, but the notion that we have not just a duty of care and regard for each other based on the notion of our common humanity and that we might love each other on the basis of the fact that we're all human, but actually that it's in our collective interest to come together, which is why we founded this thing called the Republic in the first place. Surely an accident of geography put us here, and this is how we decided to organise it. Well, let's start to organise it in that way. Thanks very much, Colin. Thank you very much. This next speaker knows very well, former Secretary General of the Department of Transport, also former Secretary General of the Department of Marine and National Resources, Head of Office at the Department of Intolerance. And I mentioned about the Loretta Convent in Wexford and John F. Kennedy passing by there in his cavalcade and visiting the nose. She's a former student of the Loretta Convent in Wexford too. And is now um, a strategic management consultant and has worked very closely with Eddie Breen and the County Council in promoting and developing new initiatives for Wexford. Will you please welcome Julia Lane. Thank you very much. Uh, I borrowed the phone to see if I can keep on time as well. Uh, the interesting thing about speaking third is you begin to pick up on the themes that some of the other speakers have already talked about. Uh, and I suppose what I want to do in a sense is start from a very personal experience of my first encounter and only encounter with John F. Kennedy. Thread that through some of the changes that I think have taken place in, in Wexford and in Ireland and in the broader world over that period and bring it right back to the personal at the end. And I go back to that day uh, in June 
1963, when I was up outside the Director Conference in my position, when the cab came to up, and when, much to our surprise, Janet Kennedy got out of the car and came over to greet Mother Clement, who was the Mother Superior, and who was the third cousin of his. He'd only discovered in the previous few days that she was his third cousin, and, and he decided, as he was wont to do, that he was going to get out of the car and greet her, even though this wasn't in the plan. On the strength of that, I actually got to meet him. I got to shake his hand. I got to touch that very shiny car. And I think that was the day that my world turned technicolor. Up until that point, uh, the world that I knew in the 1950s, uh, the late 1950s, the early 1960s in Ireland was kind of sepia coloured, and that's my recollection of all those early years. All the colours were, were browns and beiges. All of a sudden there was this very tanned, very handsome, very charming and very engaging individual who, a bit like Bill Clinton since, had that ability to make you feel that you were the only person in the space around him at the time that, that, that he made eye contact with you. Uh, and I think at that particular moment in time, Mother Clement, our Mother Superior, became cool. I don't think we knew the word cool at that stage. <laughs> in 1962, we suddenly had cool Mother Superior. Um, and certainly, uh, Janet Kennedy was the essence of cool. And I think it's looking back on it now through the lens of, of history. And, and a bit like Colm, I started off saying, well, I do some research on this. And I did a bit of reading, and I picked up a few books. And then I said, forget about that. What did it feel like? But looking back through history at that time now, I can see that he came at a moment in time which was quite defining for Ireland. And we had had at that stage, what, maybe about 40 years of independence. And um, maybe we were beginning to worry at that stage as to whether we were going to be a successful political entity or whether we were showing signs of being a failed political entity. We'd had several genera generations of immigration. And um, he himself came from an immigrant family. And suddenly here he was, arriving at a moment in time when we had uh, Sean the Mass and T.K. Whitaker at the heaven. And there was a bit of a changeover from the old guard where De Valera had moved on and, and the Mass was opening up a new vision of what Ireland could become as a much more open society. Uh, and he began to raise for us the sense of possibility uh, and the sense of promise. And that sense that I think Colin was captured very much of social solidarity and about Ireland as a small nation, a little nation having a place in the world which was an important place and could play its role. And I remember even then as, a, as barely a seven-year-old, six-year-old, having that sense of possibility and hope. And I think that legacy has stayed with me personally. Something happened to me in that moment in time which stuck with me, which stuck with me in the months that followed. And like so many other people of that generation, I remember exactly where I was the moment uh, that I learned that he had died. And I remember that sense of, of solidarity with his kids who weren't much older uh, than I was myself at that stage. In fact, one of them was younger. Um, but something stayed with me that um, being from Wexford was cool, being Irish was cool, that an Irish person could go on in that way and become um, a leader of one of the biggest nations in the world, uh, and that we could all have that possibility open to us. And I think it probably took probably two more generations before Irish Americans began to rise to the top um, of the economic space and, and not just the political space in America. And our own um, Dan Kyo, who was also a Wexford man, was one of the very first to do that. And I know the very first to be inducted into the Irish America Hall of Fame. And I think part of that legacy, um, which led to, in its own way, and contributed very significantly to the peace process, here in Ireland, and which um, led to the success of foreign direct investment in Ireland, um, was very much down to the starting point uh, that was Kennedy's visit here, and to his role as president, and, and to end to that of his, of his brothers and, and his family. And I think one of the things that really struck me very forcibly was about 20 odd years later than that, nearly 25 years later, um, uh, nearly 30 years later, my own son, Shane, uh, we had just got our home computer at home, and we had got a cart on it. This was before you had YouTube or before you had Google or anything like that. And he was just literally playing with Encarta. And I came in and I found him in front of the computer screen and he was in tears. And he was in tears over the speech uh, about going to the moon. He didn't know who John F. Kennedy was. He hadn't heard him at that stage. He was too young to know who he was. But he just said to me, Mum, who is this man? So that voice, that ability to capture something, that ability to create a sense of possibility resonated at that stage of work across a, a number of generations. And I think it still does uh, to this day. And it gave it the sense that there was something in Ireland and in Irish Americans, or American Irish, that said we never give up and we never give in and we can make change happen. And I suppose that brings me on to my second theme 
uh, and it's the theme about uh, this concept of the diaspora and how we relate to them. And in this sense, I'm, I'm picking up on some of the, the comments that Kevin made earlier, because one of the things that struck me is that we have a funny sense of what it is um, to be Irish and what it is to be part of the tribe, which is the Irish tribe, which is a worldwide tribe, which is absolutely vast and huge. And I suppose this has become a very personal issue for me now because both of our own um, children, my daughter is in Australia, my son is in China. So I am now part of that global Irish family with my own kids as part of, of, of that global diaspora. And one of the things that has struck me is that we have never really had an open and honest debate here in Ireland about the nature of our relationship with that wider tribe. That what we have is we have people who are um, have left Ireland and um, going back to those that left literally from the Keys here in New Ross at the time of the famine and left uh, because they had to um, and who felt that they had been failed by this country at the time. And in succeeding generations since then, there have been people who left because they felt the country failed them. And then we've had people, including my own kids, who've left by choice and who've left for opportunities. And maybe sometimes those of us who stayed behind feel slightly deserted by those who have left and who've gone to other, uh, to other shores and, and particularly to America. And I think there's been a, a vague sense of really deep understanding between those two sides of the Atlantic and now further afield in terms of what what it means to be Irish, what Irishness means. I know, uh, and Kevin talked about it, that sense we had sometimes of the returning yank, complete with a plaid suit and uh, green track trousers, marching in the Patrick's Day Parade, and the sense that maybe they thought that they were bigger and better than us and they could tell us a thing or two. And maybe there was a little bit of resentment and begrudgery on this side. And on the other hand, maybe looking back at us, particularly over recent years, as the Celtic Tiger took hold, there was a sense of frustration um, on their part that they were looking at us and thinking that we'd got very big fur boots and we suddenly felt we knew it all and we were better than almost anybody. And I think if one useful thing has come out of the last few very, very difficult years in this country and um, has been a return to core values and a core sense of ourselves. And, and I think maybe Colin's 